It's 4.55. Once again, I'm going to give everyone a minute to get in. Any stragglers? In the meantime, uh, think about what topics you want to see me talk about in today's lecture. This is a flex lecture. I've got a bunch, but um, I definitely want to focus on stuff people want to hear about. Hello, Twitch. Okay, it's 4.56, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so to some administrative stuff first. So uh, I forgot to post the assignment um, on Monday, but I have uploaded the assignment in Brightspace for uh, Lambda Calculus. So you're now able to submit your submissions. I fixed the due date, so it's, it's now due before lecture again and not, and not midnight like it was this week. Um, let me think. Um, but a, a, as a reminder, all of the homeworks are available for the entire class already in the PL class public repository. So, you know, you don't have to wait for me to release them. They're there. You can take a look. Um, second is I sent an announcement saying today's lecture is a Haskell Flex lecture. Um, so just to, um, uh, let me think, um, let me make a file. So what I'm planning to talk about today, um, absent any um, requests from people, I want to talk about multi-field records, uh, sorry, data types and record syntax. I want to talk about how to work with uh, traditional data structures, e.g. maps, which you know in many languages you have dictionaries or unordered maps. How do you do that in Haskell? Well, it's a little, it's a little different than what you are used to. Um, I want to talk about um, uh, this cool thing called Hoogle, and I want to talk a little bit more about like writing functions, namely uh, you know chaining and function composition. And from the old homeworks, uh, there are two things that um, showed up a bit in the office hours. So one is a lot of people thought the nonogram solver was hard, so um, we can go over the solution for that. And the other is um, shrinking in calculator. Also, um, a lot of people had questions about that. So uh, hopefully that's given all of you enough time to think about what it is you want to hear about. And I want you to just go and um, write something in the chat. Um, you can say nothing um, if you don't uh, like have anything to ask for. But I want you to write something in the chat um, about your requests for other things I should talk about today. I see someone has asked for concurrency in Haskell. Um, concurrency is cool, and I can't teach you about it yet because, um, because we don't have enough tools yet. I need to teach you about monads first before we can get there. Um, how set is implemented? Yeah, we can talk about that. I'm waiting. <laughs> Let's fire up GHCI while we're in the meantime. Input output, that's a good one. Um, we'll talk about that in more detail when we do the monads lecture. I see a request for more on list comprehensions, which I am absolutely happy to do. Um, that, that'll be a good uh, play. Uh, we can work that into the nonogram solver. All right. 
Uh, it was easier doing this in a physical setting because I could pass out pieces of paper to everyone and then um, collect them up. But uh, okay, fine. Uh, this is good enough. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks to everyone who actually submitted to the chat. And uh, I'll just go ahead and get started now. Okay, so um, what order do I want to do these in? Let's do it in. Let's do it in this order. Okay. So. Topic one, multi-field data types. So um, those of you uh, who were at the algebraic data type lecture, you may remember that um, in Haskell, we can define algebraic data types, right? And um, uh, what does this look like? Well, we write some sort of, um, we say data ADT, and then we define some number of constructors. And then for every constructor, we can define as many fields as we want for it. So let me just, um, turn this into sort of more reasonable type of data type. So like, let's say we want to define a data type representing people. Um, oh, another question, which is, um, what is GHC good or not good at optimizing? That's an interesting question. Maybe we can get to that in the end. So, so we have this person data type and uh, uh, we are going to represent a bunch of things like, you know, uh, let me put some comments on this so that we can more easily see. Like we might want their age. Their name and, you know, like, are they enrolled in our class, for example. So there's a bunch of fields here, and um, uh, there are a bunch of things that you might want to do when you have a data type like this, right? Like one of the things you might want to do is to be able to get out entries from these fields in question. So when we have um, a data type defined in this way, there's only one way we can do it, and that is pattern matching, you know, our, our, our sort of handy trick for doing everything. So like, let's say I want to get out the age from a person well, I'm going to pattern match on my argument. There's one constructor, it's called person. By the way, the constructor can share the same name as the type in question. And um, it's a typical convention in Haskell, which is that if you have a data type and it only has one constructor, as is in this case, uh, the constructor is typically called the same thing as the data type itself. You don't have to do it that way, but it's often helpful to do it that way. Um, there's another question in chat, which is, is there a main function? The answer is yes, there is a main function. And we'll talk about that in IO. Um, and another question about how Haskell reduces overhead associated with recursion, which we will talk about a little later uh, when we talk about control and namely specifically um, tail calls. Uh, there's also a question, you know, how do I structure my Haskell project. It's also very reasonable. So when I wanna, um, ooh, a request for debugging, um, that's good. Let me put that here. Okay, so I have this record named person and um, I have, uh, I have three fields in it, so I need a pattern match on each of them. And in this particular case, I wanna get the age out. So uh, I bind age to some variable. I don't care about anything else because I'm just extracting out the age, and then I just return it from this function. And indeed, when I do that, and I ask what get age type is, it takes a person and produces an integer. Now, this is kind of a pain because we have to write these functions for every single field, and that's annoying, and you don't wanna have to do that. So Haskell has this thing called record syntax, which helps you um, deal with this kind of situation. So here's how record syntax works. So instead of putting the fields one by one like this, we um, add curly braces. Um, curly braces in Haskell uh, typically mean records are involved. So uh, um, they, they don't get used for regular like exp statements. And then uh, instead of defining just um, the types one by one, we have to give a name, which is the name of the field in question, and then uh, the type, uh, and then we say colon colon whatever the field's type should be. So here's a bunch of names. 
and this also defines a record. Um, but there's a few, and and similarly, um, all the good old-fashioned pattern matching still works. So, for example, get age is still a function that you know can take in a person that I can define manually, and I'll still get out the age in that case. But it gives us a few more things we can do. So one is that we are able, we are given automatically three functions, one per field defined on the record. So there is a function named age, and it does exactly the same thing as get age. Similarly, there's a function named enrolled, does exactly the same thing as enrolled, and there's a function named name, and it extracts out the name of the person in question. Additionally, when I construct a record, I don't have to um, enter the arguments positionally. Um, like I did with person to true Bob. Instead, I can do it with curly braces. So the syntax is I write my constructor, I open my curly braces, and then for each field, I specify what I want the field value to be. And that also you know, gives me a person, which I in turn can get out. Um, in fact, there's also a thing called record update syntax where I can um, edit only one of the um, fields on the record to modify it if I need it. Uh, although I didn't, I didn't derive show from person, so let me do that. Yes. And there we go. So that's handy, and we'll be using the record syntax quite a bit when we do uh, type classes. Um, one thing to note is if you have multiple fields on a multiple constructors for a data type, um, these uh, field selectors are partial because they only work when I give it a real honest to goodness person. If I give it no person, I will get an exception in this case. So most people don't use record syntax when you have multiple constructors. They just use the positional syntax because you still want to encourage people to do pattern matching in that case. Record syntax is mostly used when you only have one constructor. Um, there's a question in chat, which is, um, what happens if another data type also uses age as a field? And the answer is, it is um, ambiguous. multiple declarations of age. Um, this is a long-standing wart in Haskell, and I believe there are some like new GHC uh, extensions which help deal with this sort of situation. But in general, um, uh, the fields all get dumped into global namespace, unlike, unlike other languages. So most people will um, name, their rec uh, name their fields with some sort of prefix that disambiguates uh, what, what record it um, belongs to. So maybe you would say foo age, instead of just age by itself. OK, that's everything I want to say about records. All right, uh, let's hit um, let's hit, hit how to hit uh, work with traditional data structures, because that will give me a chance to talk about Hoogle. And uh, I'll also be able to answer the question, which was how is set implemented. OK, so Haskell, as I've told everyone, is a purely functional programming language. So um, when we have data structures in Haskell, we don't work with them in the traditional way. And we've seen a lot of this when we were working with lists, right? For example, um, when I had a list and I wanted to append something to the end of it, well, uh, you know, in JavaScript, you might just, uh, you know, say, okay, well, given that list, append to it, append two to it, and then I'd have that, you know, that, that very same list, that mutable list with a two added to it. But in Haskell, you were doing all sorts of different things, right? You you had some list, and you could you know build extra things onto it, um, but you couldn't you know, for example, concatenate two lists together without just making an entirely new list. And if I had two lists, you know, it's just sort of just outstanding, and I concatenated them together, the original lists wouldn't be affected; they'd still be the same old thing. Because as I said, in Haskell, we're pure, and we don't actually mutate our data structures. So this causes some troubles when you want to um, do some more advanced data structures. For example, a very useful data structure that a lot of people 
um, like to use are maps. So maps let you, um, you know, basically do the same thing as dictionaries, um, uh, have some sort of key, and then you can look up the key and get out um, the value from the data description question. So how exactly do you work with a map in Haskell? Well, let's take a look. Um, so maps are not part of the standard library, so we have to actually go ahead and get out, um, get out, uh, get out um, an import for the library in question. So um, maps are defined in data.map. Um, furthermore, uh, data.map, so w previously we were talking about these field selectors, right? And it was like, they all get dumped into a global namespace. So um, data map also like has a similar idea, which is that it has a lot of functions defined on it and they're all very like generic sounding, like empty or insert or something like that. So it'd be very confusing if you dumped all of those names into your namespace. So typically people will import um, the data.map uh, module as qualified. That just means, well, um, don't dump everything into the global namespace, just uh, bind some module name, which we can actually get stuff in that way. So, uh, so for example, the map module now has a empty uh, function, but if I ask for empty by itself, you know, it's not in scope. And NGHC will helpfully suggest that um, you can get it from data.map. Um, another thing people will typically do in this situation is the, the type, the name of the type in question is something that you don't really want to keep typing map.map .map for. So people will often import just the uh, name of the, uh, the type of the data structure in question so that you don't have to keep, so you don't have to keep typing it. So instead of map.map, .map, uh, it's just a map kda because those names tend to be fairly unique. Okay. So how do you work with a map in Haskell? Well, um, there are a bunch of functions and I'm going to tell you about two of them and then we'll um, look at use Google to find some more. So, um, so as I said, everything is immutable, right? So because everything is immutable, um, there is, uh, if you want, for example, a map that doesn't contain anything, uh, well, that's just going to be some value and you can just refer to it by um, talking about the map.empty uh, map .empty function. Well, really it's not a function, it's just a value. It, you know, always is available in the situation. So that gives us an empty map. And let's say we want to add something to this map. Well, ordinarily, you would mutate the map to put some element in it. But because this is Haskell, instead what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, run a function on our input map, the empty map, and do the insertion, and then we're going to get back as a result a new map, which is the result of having added the um, quantity to the map in question. So the function that will let us do this is insert. So let's go ahead and ask um, what the type signature of insert is so we can figure out what we need to do. So there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, hopefully it's not too obscure. So there's this or k constraint. That's a type class. We'll talk more about this constraint later, but basically it just says that whatever your key is on the map, we have to be able to compare them because um, if they're not comparable, well, there's no way we can actually index on them. Um, then there are three arguments. So this function is polymorphic, but the, 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 the naming is suggestive. So there's a type name called K. Remember lower lowercase types are type variables. So anything can be used for them. Um, and K is suggestive of key. So K is the type of the key. Um, then there is an A. A is just the generic catch all type used in Haskell for any random value you don't care about. So that's what the values we store in the map are. And then the last argument is a map from K to A. Uh, map is a good old fashioned data structure and um, it takes two type arguments, right? Because there are many kinds of maps, right? You might have maps of strings to integers, you might have maps of ints to ints. And so the two type variables let you say, hey, this is what I want the input types of the, uh, uh, the key type of the map to be and what I want the uh, output type to be. And then finally we turn the new map, which has got the result in question. I see your question, we are about to get to it. So let's just go ahead and insert something in the map. So let's do a map of strings to strings, I guess. Um, foo bar and then map.empty. And indeed, uh, the result is we get a um, map that maps foo to bar. 
Um, by the way, why does it render like this? Well, it turns out there's a function called map to list, uh, sorry, from list, which takes a list of key value pairs and then produces a map from it. So there, there isn't a native map syntax. Not, you can't use curly braces. Remember, curly braces are being used for records. So, uh, so it just prints out a, you know, a sort of short Haskell program that if you had run it, would have given you um, the same map you had in question. And we can also do this again. Well, let me first assign this to a variable. We can do the insertion again. And now indeed we have a map that has, uh, oopsies, I uh, assigned it to itself. So now we have a map that has two elements in it and the original map is un, uh, unaffected. So there's a question in chat, which is, does this mean Haskell uses more memory compared to other languages because there will be one copy for each version of the map when it's modified? And the answer is yes and no. Um, and this is a good segue in how set is implemented. Well, actually, how is set implemented? Sets are just uh, our maps from a key to nothing. And, and they're, they're, it's basically the same representation. Um, so it's yeah, so the answer is yes in the sense that um, you know we're obviously doing something uh, a little unusual because in a typical uh, implementation of a dictionary, um, you wouldn't have this capability, right? You wouldn't be able to see all the versions, old, older versions of your data structure in a situation like this. So Haskell does have to work harder to actually give this capability, um, this capability of seeing all the previous versions of your data structure in question. So yes, there, we're gonna use more memory. Um, it also doesn't help that um, these are uh, ordered maps. So uh, the way they're implemented is not um, like a hash table, but they are in fact or, uh, implemented as good old fashioned binary trees. So you know how, how do binary trees work? Well, these are balanced binary trees. So every element gets put somewhere and we maintain the order on the binary tree in question. So like um, maybe, maybe this would have been a valid binary tree, right? And then we would hang off the actual values um, in the nodes in question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll hit that question in a little bit. Okay, so, so now why did I say that it doesn't use that much memory? Well, because there are some tricks we can play. And to see the tricks we can play um, in the data representation, we need to go back, I, I wanna first go back to um, uh, Haskell lists, right? So in Haskell, uh, the lists um, are implemented as singly linked lists. So uh, if I list one, two, three, four, what does that look like? Well, I have a node named one, and that points to a node that's two, and that points to a node that's three, and that points to a node that's four. And now if I add something at the beginning of this list, let's say I, you know, cons on zero, what happens in this case? Well, naively, I would have to copy every element on the list and add a new one. But in Haskell, I don't have to do that because this list is immutable. It will never change. So I don't have to worry about someone swooping in and um, uh, replacing it with some other values that you know weren't the ones that I expected in this case. Instead, I can just hang my zero off of the pre-existing data structure, sharing the data with the previous list in question. So yes, this is a little inefficient because to actually represent this, I need to use up a machine word uh, to do the pointer to the head of the list. And in Haskell, I also have to use another machine word saying, hey, this is a list node and not some other random thing. But, um, but I don't have to do an O of N copy of the list in question. And that, that saves us a lot. So going back to sets and maps, um, the same idea applies to binary trees which is that um, if you have a very large binary tree and you say insert an element on it, you only have to update logarithmic in the size of the number of nodes in the tree uh, to um, actually uh, insert the element in question. Because what you, what you end up having to do is there's some path down the spine of the tree to where you're gonna insert the element. And so you're gonna edit that, uh, basically allocating new nodes to put the element in. But all of the other subtrees, assuming that you know they're relatively balanced, can get reused directly. And so you don't actually have to copy the entirety of the tree every time you do it. That's about as much as I want to talk about um, 
with uh, internal representation of data, data structures. We won't really have any problem sets on it, but I do recommend uh, this book by Okasaki, uh, Functional Data Structures, um, which goes into a lot more detail. Uh, I'm just making sure I got the name right. Uh, purely functional data structures. Purely functional data structures, which offer a lot of um, uh, guidance on um, how these are actually implemented. Um, okay, so uh, hitting up some questions. So uh, there was a question about imports. Um, and uh, uh, um, the question is basically, are Haskell imports similar to Python imports? And the answer is yes, um, there are a lot of similarities. So uh, importing qualified is import uh, m as, you know, sorry, map as m. And, uh, you know, importing only certain things from it, actually it's pretty similar syntax. Uh, sorry, from from map import. Uh, that's how you would have done it in Python. Uh, there's another question, which is, are there alternative data structures that are used like immutable data structures, but can get compiled to immutable data structures when appropriate? Um, that's also a great question. And uh, the answer is, in Haskell, that's fairly difficult to do. Because once again, I said Haskell is uh, purely functional, so everything is expected to be immutable. So um, yes, in some cases you can use mutability under the hood as long as you never get caught out on it. But it's pretty hard to actually provide those guarantees in practice. However, there are some languages with uh, so-called linear types. Actually, Haskell is one of them, although they don't get used for this particular purpose. In a language with so-called linear types, um, you can express the constraint that a variable is only used once. And there's a really useful constraint to be able to express if you want to go ahead and mutate it later, because, um, because now you can... Um, now, because you know that the variable is only get it going to get used once, even though you, it's pure, you know that it's never going to be used again, so you can just go ahead and mutate it, and uh, you won't get caught out on it. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning more about this sort of thing, I recommend checking out a research language called Coca, which talks more about this. And I will, I will post the, this Haskell file at the end of this lecture. Um, OK, I promised something about Hoogle, so let me briefly talk about that. So uh, I, uh, I, I knew empty and insert were functions that I wanted to use. But what if you, know, you don't actually know what the function you wanted to use was? Um, and a pretty normal way to go about um, solving that problem is you just uh, uh, you know, search up the module in question, and then you would uh, you know, go to the documentation, and then maybe you'd start looking until you found the type you had in question. But remember, Haskell is a very strongly typed language. And in fact, we don't have to worry about, um, we don't have to worry about uh, like uh, reading through the documentation. We can just think up of what the type we want our function to be, and then ask Google, our friendly uh, uh, search by type engine, to find the function that we want and uh, you know, get it for us. So for example, um, I might want to be able to remove an element from a map. So what kind of, what, what would that look like? Well, um, to remove a function from a map, uh, I need a map. And I'll need a key saying what I want to remove from it. And then uh, I will want to get out a map with that removed. So I can imagine that the type of this function is going to take a map, it's going to take a key, and it's going to return a map. And so I've entered this into Hoogle. Hoogle's looking for uh, functions that look kind of like this. Um, it won't do an exact match, which is very helpful because, for example, um, the real delete function requires an ORD K constraint, and in fact, the key comes first. But you can see that it has found the function that does the thing I want it to do. And you don't have to use this only on, um, you don't have to use this only on uh, like maps. Um, let's say you were like working on your uh, project 
and you're like, man, I really want a function that takes in an integer and takes in a value and returns a list of um, uh, uh, a list that has that many copies of the value duplicated that much. Um, and uh, I told you in lecture that this is called replicate, but you could have also used Hoogle to find that out for yourself. And, and Hoogle indeed knows that, hey, there's a function that has this type signature. So Hoogle's really cool, really powerful. And uh, if you didn't know about it already, um, uh, you know, try it out the next time you're like, man, I need to do something in Haskell and I don't know how to do it, but I can say what the type is. And then the type often is enough to help you find what you need in that situation. Okay, um, so that's all I wanted to talk about uh, maps. So we are 25, uh, we are 30 minutes in. That's good, making good time. Um, let us talk about, okay, let's jump a moment to the nonogram solver. Um, and this will be a good uh, opportunity to do some list comprehensions. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna pull up the class itself. And once again, questions whenever you want, uh, please just type them in. Twitch, I hope it's all working for you because it's been very quiet today and I didn't actually check if it's working or not. It's basic, not calculator. Glad to hear it. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry about this. Okay, so let's um let's take a look at um nonograms. So I'm going to assume everyone here has actually read the problem description, and we're going to look at um, uh, how the solution for configs work. Um, so this is a kind of tricky question, and one of the reasons why this question is, is tricky is, well, one, you have to figure out how you're going to solve the problem recursively, and two is um, there's, a, there's a trap. And the trap in this question is that we have to do something different depending on whether or not uh, we're, you know, it's a little hard to explain, um, but basically the problem is um, when we're setting up the um, first set of X's, uh, we always put a white space after it. But for the last series of X's, um, we can go flush against the end. So we actually need two uh, sort of you know versions of our program to be able to handle this sort of situation. So how might we go about solving a problem like this? So I said that when we're doing recursion, we always want to look at the base case. So let's think about what the base case here is. So um, we could say the base case is what happens when uh, you know, the size of our uh, configs is zero. Um, clearly we should just produce a empty, empty list in the situation. And that's certainly okay. But a more useful base case is um, what happens when we have only one uh, one uh, nonogram sequence, you know, like two left in our situation, and we want to say what happens in this case, right? So, for example, uh, we might want to visualize rows. Uh, we want, want want the configs for five and two. And that should look something like this. Okay, so how can we go about actually implementing this? So something that um, a lot of people uh, used in their solutions was a list comprehension for the situation. Because um, a lot of things line up with what sort of situation we want to do, right? We need to produce five configurations, uh, four configurations, sorry, in this case. Can I count? I can count. Yeah, oh, it's four. We need to produce four configurations, right? One per sliding things over. So let's go ahead and say, hey, 
um, you know, we want to somehow loop over uh, some, you know, going from zero. Uh, well, let, let's count up, you know, how many uh, spaces we want to put before our sequence to something. And I'm not going to say what that something is right now. So remember, the syntax for a list comprehension is uh, you, you, you write down a list. Um, you write down what you want to actually put for each element of the list. You put a pipe, and then you can write uh, basically what you want to iterate over. Um, you know, so for every value in this list, binding those values to i will generate an element here. So a little bit of arithmetic will reveal to us that um, we need to generate a 0 to n minus uh, x um, minus 1 entries. So um, we can figure this from here. So we max out with three spaces. And um, oh, it's not minus 1. It's just uh, n minus x. Well, maybe this is wrong. We'll find out very shortly. So we want to go from 0 to n minus x. And the idea here is we're going to say, well, we want to put that many falses into our solution. And then we want to put that many x's, sorry, trues into that, uh, sorry, as many trues as was implied by the x in question. And then finally, we need to fill out the rest of the you know, spaces left. And that's just going to be n minus x minus i. And I can um, put some spacing here so this is easier to see. And so we kind of want to know if this worked or not. So let's just run it. So I'll give myself 5 and 2. And I want to, um, what's it called again? Visualize rows. And indeed, um, it looks right. So we have um, four possibilities, and we're just sliding it over uh, once each time. Now let's say I um, actually you know, subtracted by one earlier, right? Because I was like, maybe I need that extra thing. Um, and uh, when I look at my output, I can see that, hey, um, you know, I don't have all the solutions that I need in this case. And um, I'm not sure how I would explain how I would come to the conclusion that the indexing uh, was an off by one error, but I guess one um, one sort of uh, thing that you know I find applies to me when I'm writing Haskell code is this is not very long, right? So it's it's a loop, and inside the loop I'm you know stitching some stuff together, but this is sort of um, a a atomic chunk of functionality which I can reason about in isolation, and I think that's a generally good philosophy. Um, when you're writing Haskell code, which is that you don't want your functions to be too big and unwieldy because then remember Haskell, well, we, we, there is a trace functionality, right? So like, for example, if you really wanted to, we could have, you know, so for example, asked Haskell to tell us, you know, what the value of I was uh, for each iteration of the, um, of the list comprehension. And um, if we run this, we see that first i is 0, then i is 1, then i is 2, then i is 3, right? And that's certainly something we can do. But it's just a lot easier to keep your function small and then you know run them and then you know see, see if they do what you expect. And if it's small enough, you can just sort of figure it out directly whether or not it works or not. By the way, you might be wondering why the output looks funny here. And remember, this is because Haskell is a lazy language. So we're actually generating these um, possibilities on the fly um, as we go. So um, the code never didn't get actually run until we started printing things out with visualized rows. OK. Um, I want to um, ask the person who wanted more about list comprehensions uh, what they um, wanted to know a little bit more about. So we'll, in particular, uh, I can think of one thing you might want to want to know about, which is like, what if I want to do, what if I want to do nested loops? 
unfortunately, the um, the non-base case is a great way we can look at this case. But if there's something else you wanted to know about list comprehensions, um, please please do tell. But yeah, so list comprehension has two parts. It has the individual elements. So this is just describing one element inside the list that I'm going to produce, and then a um, you know basically uh, indexing variable that says what I'm going to iterate over. All right, so how um, am I going to handle the other case when I have um, multiple things that I want to do with my nonogram solver? So intuitively, the idea is what I want to do is I just want to place the, the first element, four in this example. I want to give myself a space, and then I want to recursively place uh, the leftover um, uh, strips uh, on whatever the leftover space is. So there's going to be some recursive call involved, and um, there's going to be another loop involved. And so we're going to go ahead and try to implement this. So first off, uh, I need to know how much I want to slide uh, this entry across. So I don't really know, but um, if we think about this, um, we, we, we know we can't slide all the way to the end, because if we slide all the way to the end, uh, we're going to run out of um, space to insert our extra um, you know, spacing for the rest of the things. In fact, we don't really want to slide even all the way until we have you know, only one thing left, because then there'd be no space for the rest of the x's. But um, uh, that'll work out uh, in a little bit. So let's, let's just ignore that for now. Um, as always, you know, we can always fix that later. OK, so we want to iterate from, uh, once again, looking at the spacings. And so we want to do the same thing, which is we're going to say, hey, uh, you know, insert that many falses. And then we're going to insert uh, as many trues as was requested. And then this time, what I want to do is I want to put a space. right? I want to put a space just saying, hey, uh, now I'm going to put whatever the rest of the um, uh, configuration that you figured out was. And so now there's a few questions in hand, right? So we need to somehow make a recursive call to configs, um, basically asking for the placement of everything else. So here is um, you know, some parts of it. So uh, we want a configs call, and we have already placed the x. So we want to say, OK, how would you lay out uh, the rest of the x's uh, uh, from the nonogram in question? And for the um, the the how much size we have left, well, let's think about it, right? So we used to have n, but we used up i of it to place the, um, the falses. We used up uh, another x of it to um, place the trues. And then we used up another one to place the you know, spacer in this case. And so this seems like maybe it'll work, but it actually doesn't work. And why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because um, there's a type mismatch. Because configs, remember, gives all possible configurations. But in this context, um, we're just trying to um, give one particular configuration. So what we actually want to do is we want to iterate over every result from configs and then uh, you know, give the result here. Well, fortunately, list comprehensions have your back. So if you want to do nested loops in list comprehensions, it's as simple as adding a comma and then doing a, another uh, a bind uh, for the next thing you want to loop over. So here's how to read this. So for every i in going from 0 to n minus x minus 1, and for every rest from the results of calling, calling configs uh, uh, and those arguments, uh, generate an element on the list that has um, this, uh, this value. And we can see that this certainly will type check. By the way, we could have, um, oh, yes. Uh, so here's a question, which is, is there a way to apply conditions on the expressions to the right of the pipe? Um, and uh, the answer is yes. So for example, let's say that um, uh, we are uh, kind of being funny. And we're like, OK, I want to, uh, I want to do the spacing. But actually, there's a constraint, which is my spaces have to be even. So I'm not allowed to do odd size spaces. So to do that, I use a comma. 
And then instead of writing one of these arrow expressions, I just put a Boolean expression and that works like a filter. It says only consider i's where i is even. Um, so let me first show you what the result looks like um, with this ver version. So we see that we have indeed, uh, no, there's a problem and we'll fix this in a moment. We can see that um, most of everything is working okay, um, except for this last one where I'm not actually doing the nonogram correctly. And um, if I put in my goofy even I constraint, now I see that I only have done cases where um, uh, there were uh, two or zero spaces. So I, I don't do the one space case anymore. Filtering and iterating are the most useful things. Um, there's also a syntax for like uh, zipping things, but I don't actually remember how that syntax works off the top of my head. Okay, so there's a bug in our code, and this is a great segue into the question that was asked, which is how do you debug Haskell code, right? Like I've got this code and it's not working, what do I do? So here's how I think about this particular bug. So what I see is going on here is um, first I need to think about what I want this code to look like. And um, all the answers here look very reasonable, but there's one answer that doesn't look good and it's this one. And why doesn't it look good? Well, it doesn't look good because I placed the X's here. There's no space to place the twos and somehow um, my program has said, oh, well, that's okay. It doesn't matter if you can't place it. So why did this happen? Well, um, we have a few tools in our toolbox for figuring this out, right? We can add some debug print statements. Um, we can also just think about our code. We can think about like, what is the code doing in this case? And uh, you know, what code actually gets executed? You know, like when you're doing a um, whiteboard interview and you know, the uh, interviewer says, okay, can you run it on this uh, uh, input? Um, you know, that's something that you should get in practice doing on Haskell code because it's often the easiest way to figure out what's gone wrong. So let's just think about this case. So in this case, i equals five, and uh, we've gone ahead and placed the x's, and uh, we're gonna do this recursive call to configs. So n is 10, i is five, x is four, so 10 minus five minus four minus one, that gives me zero. So I'm doing call to config zero x's. And you know, if you're too lazy to like work that out, we can always put in a debug statement that tells us what the answer is, right? N minus i minus x minus one. Try it again. And it tells us, hey, um, this is zero. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna call configs with n equal to zero and x is, is not empty. So we go to our function and we're like, okay, what gets called in that case? Well, I've got this configuration that says when n is zero and um, I don't care whatever x is, is, then I just give you empty. And indeed, there's a problem here, which is that I return, I say, well, it's always valid to produce an empty board in that case. But actually that's not true, right? It's only valid to produce an empty board if I don't have to do any nonograms left over. And now I have solved the problem. This question, which is what is the type signature of trace? Well, we can just ask GCI colon T trace. And then it says trace is a function that takes a string and an A and produces an A. Um, yeah, so let's go over this again. So when I added that trace uh, call, like what exactly was I doing? And then why did I use the dollar sign? Dollar sign is very useful. So, um, so remember Haskell is uh, pure, right? So normally when you wanna add a print statement, you just add a new statement with a print on it and you're done, uh, no problems. But Haskell doesn't work that way, right? Because there's no statements. And so what we instead have to do is the way that we do uh, debugging, uh, we do tracing is we say when this expression gets evaluated, then print this string. So what's going on here with this type signature is it's saying, hey, give me some expression, any expression, I don't care what it is, um, that hasn't been evaluated and attach the string to it. And then whenever the resulting A, the, the, the new expression gets evaluated, print out the string and then return A as normal. 
So the reason why, you know, um, so when I write this, and remember what the dollar sign does is it just, you know, lets me avoid having to write parentheses around the right hand side, then uh, uh, what happens is I'm executing, and remember Haskell's lazy, so there's like interleaving going on, but at every time I actually hit this, um, you know, I have to print it out before I keep going with the rest of the execution in question. There's a question on Twitch, which is that, is there a way to debug interactively in Haskell? And the answer is there is. There is a debugger in JCI, and I actually have no idea how to use it. So uh, you're gonna have to look online to see how to use it. Um, I personally have always uh, used traces, and I've always you know, used reasoning about the code in my head to debug Haskell code. I'm sorry if that's not a very satisfying explanation. Maybe, maybe someday I should learn how to use a debugger. Questions. Why does laziness cause bang to show like that? Um, that's a great question. And um, let me see, can I answer this question? So we'll have a lecture on laziness um, and we will implement lazy evaluation in JavaScript, which will give you more intuition about what's going on. But essentially what's happening and um, I guess this is kind of related to the optimization question. When I visualize a row, um, some input output code, uh, what actually happens is um, I don't ask for all the rows to be evaluated before I start ex uh, before I start printing to the screen. Instead, I will lazily evaluate the rows, um, uh, asking for them one by one as I want to go. Right? And that, by the way, is the reason why, for example, I can print an infinite list, right? Because if I had to compute the infinite list first before um, printing it, then this should just not terminate. But instead, what it does is it you know, actually is able to print things one by one. And that's because the infinite list doesn't get uh, eagerly created. It just gets you know, lazily created, and we just produce things as we go along. So because we're executing configurations lazily, um, the, tra the, the debug print statements, right? I said they only get printed when that expression gets evaluated, but we're lazy. So that expression doesn't get evaluated until we're further along in the computation and we've already printed stuff out. And that's why it looks that way. Great question. Okay, let's pop back to our um, top level bonus. So we've done de debugging, known ground solver, uh, list of comprehensions. Um, okay, let's do writing functions. Uh, there's a question which is, could record syntax theoretically deal with overlapping records by creating a type class such as has age and then pattern match on the type? Would this be considered too much magic or too confusing so it's not done by default? Um, so that's a great question. And in fact, there is a proposal for doing just this um, called overloaded record dot. Actually, it's not a proposal. It's been added to the language. Oh, and GC 9.2. This is what I get for not keeping up with uh, the language. So if your GHC is sufficiently new, apparently you can reuse the field names. And what actually happens in the situation? Um, it does exactly what you suggested, which is that there is a type class called has field. And so there is a, um, there is a, uh, yeah, so when you define a record like that, it says there, it has this field, and that's why you can now share the names. So very nice question, and in fact, you predicted. It took a really long time for GHC to figure out what they wanted to do in this case, because there's a lot of different possible ways to go about solving the overloaded record name problem, and like people wrote like like dozens of competing proposals, and it just it took a very long time for people to figure out what they wanted to do here.
I, I actually have no idea how this works in practice. So um, it's a, you, you should try it out if you're interested. OK, so I also promised to talk about uh, writing functions, namely chaining and composition. Uh, so uh, let's, let's do this. So um, we've talked a lot about um, functions that do, we've talked a little bit about higher order functions, right? So for example, I introduced, so we, we, we spent a bunch of time talking about um, list comprehension stuff just now, but I want to remind you that you don't have to use a list comprehension for everything. Haskell also has perfectly good higher order functions for doing things, right? Like map was a higher order function we talked about. And um, you know, if I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, for example, add two to every single element in a list, um, I can write it this way. And this is, you know, reasonably, uh, reasonably shorter than the list comprehension version, right? Why is it shorter than the list comprehension version? Well, um, the main difference here, and I'm not saying shortness is a virtue necessarily, but um, in this particular case, I think it makes it very clear what the intention is. And one reason uh, that um, it's shorter is because I didn't have to um, talk about this intermediate variable i in this situation, right? Um, this map statement is written in so-called point-free style where I don't actually need to um, refer to things exclusively by name. I've instead used this um, operator section to represent plus two without saying any names. And operator sections are all cool, but you know, uh, uh, if I have a regular old function, and you know I can pass it in, then I can just you know pass it in directly without having to write a lambda myself. And you know once again, this what does it do? Well, it filters out all the even, filters a list so that only even elements are left, right? So I get two four in this case. This is very short, very compact. I didn't have to write, you know, a lambda for this case. By the way, those of you who are thinking about the Lambda calculus uh, lecture, remember uh, even and lambda x, even x being equivalent, that's eta expansion. Or eta, um, yeah. What I've done is I've eta expanded the function in this particular case. And, um, you know, just to remind you, um, if I had to write this in list comprehension style, I'd have to do something like this. So this is pretty short. Now, um, there are some things that you might want to do sometimes. Like, for example, um, what if I want to uh, first um, add a function? Uh, let's see, what do I want to do? Let's say that I, want, I have a list and I want to um, I want to add two to it, and then I want to stringify the resulting integer. So, in that situation, do I have to write a lambda? La writing a lambda would certainly work, right? So I'm going to add two to it, and then I'm going to print the result. I'm going to show the result. And that indeed gives me a list of strings in this case. But I don't have to do this either. Remember, Haskell's a higher order language, right? We can do all sorts of fun things with functions. And so um, I can instead uh, compose these two functions using the so-called dot operator, um, reminiscence of mathematical composition. So what does the dot operator do? Well, it takes two functions as arguments, and it returns another function as its result. Um, well, technically, it takes three arguments um, and returns a C. But remember uh, what I said about how the parentheses work for arrows, right? Um, all functions in Haskell are curried. So if you only gave dot two arguments, then it would give you this function that's waiting for an A to produce a C. So dot works the same way the mathematical composition operator uh, works. And um, so uh, if I wanted to compose two functions, uh, let's say that you know I want to add first and then multiply, uh, I could do it this way. So, so to write this example from above, um, to map, I want to show and then compose it with plus two. The composition sort of is backwards, so like you first run the function on the right hand side, then on the left hand side. And because this is an operator, like we can uh, do all sorts of things. For example, I can then say, tell me what the length of the string is, right? I can compose as many times as I want. 
And what that, what, what, am I, what am I doing? Well, I'm adding two to the number, I'm turning it into a string, and then I'm asking what the length of the string is. And once again, I still have this. So this is sort of very typical of idiomatic Haskell, which is um, what we call sort of uh, uh, whole meal programming. That is to say, we don't spend all our time, you know, like laboriously writing our loops one by one or you know, like laboriously binding all our variables and then doing things to them. Although certainly sometimes that's the only thing we can do. What we like to do in Haskell is we like to take a bunch of functions and then put them together to form the types of things that we want to do. For example, uh, we did this map uh, in question on this list. And what if I um, wanted to then filter the list um, afterwards? Well, uh, I can simply compose the map with a filter and then I, you know, get a, um, uh, I, I, uh, I now have a bigger function, which I've once again just done by sort of um, composing stuff together into a pipeline. So this idea of like pipelines and like putting together filters and maps and that sort of thing, it's a really useful concept because a lot of systems have been built with the same idea of like setting up pipelines of values going on. For example, um, you may have heard of a thing called MapReduce, which is a way of doing um, sort of very large uh, a computation on very large data sets, distributing it over multiple machines. Well, why is it called MapReduce? Well, it, that's because there's two main steps to it, right? First, it does a map, a map here, and then it does a reduction, sort of combining all of the elements together. Um, earlier, uh, we briefly looked at like sum and product. Those are examples of reductions, but in general, um, it's some sort of fold. So if you can think about it, in the Haskell terms, right, of like putting the functions together in this composition pipeline, then that is really helpful when you're dealing with like something like MapReduce where you have to like write Java classes for your mappers and reducers. And it's kind of hard to understand, but if you've got that mental picture in your head, it makes it a lot easier to understand, um, you know, what exactly you're doing. Um, I also want to talk about chaining because um, chaining is a kind of sort of related situation and um, so another like thing you might want to do when you're writing Haskell code is you might want to like maintain, like pass around multiple things at once, right? So this is a sort of very nice and easy situation where we're only passing around, uh, we're only passing around a single list, right? We, we, you know, map over the list, then we filter it. That's very easy. But like, what if we need to, for example, uh, we want to you know, do some work and also maintain a list of log statements saying what the work we've done are. are. So um, let, me, let me give an example of this. So let's say that um, we're writing a little calculator and, um, and let's say that uh, we wanna do an addition. And so what, what is this gonna do? Well, it's gonna take two integers and it's going to return an integer. Well, let's say I also want it to um, return a, you know, let's say a string saying what the calculation I did was. So let's go ahead and try to implement this function. Oh, by the way, um, Haskell supports tuples. I didn't really talk about them very much, um, but tuples, unlike lists, can have different ele uh, types in their uh, elements. So this is a tuple where the first element is int and the second element is a string. And so uh, unlike lists, they can be heterogeneous. Um, and as a result, though, they have a fixed length. So this only ever has two elements in it. So how am I going to implement this? So I'm going to add A and B together. And then I'm also going to um, produce a string log message that says, um, Hey, when I added A and B, I got, and maybe I should have given this a single name, result using a where clause once again, and then print, print the result.
So if I calculate, right, I get five and I also get the log minus saying, hey, two plus three equals five. So what then do I have to do if I wanna say, uh, do two additions, right? So what do I wanna do? So I wanna, I, I, I've got an A and a B and a C and what I wanna do is I wanna compute A plus B plus C and I wanna see all the intermediate results from the situation. So how can I do this? Well, it's kind of annoying to do it in the normal way, right? So if I call calc plus on AB, I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get a, a tuple, right? So I can't just do calc plus AB and then calc plus C. This will give me a type error. It'll tell me, tell me hey, uh, calc plus was expecting an integer, but you gave me an integer and a list of strings, right? I don't care about that list of strings. Please don't give me the list of strings. So what should we do instead? Well, we should do some pattern matching. Right, so when I pattern match, uh, I can get out uh, you know, what the result is and what the logs are. By the way, in fact, I don't even need to do a case of, although I told everyone that case of is what you need to do, if there is only one constructor and tuples only have one constructor, you can just do a let statement instead. And that will work just as fun, just as well. And so now I can call calc plus uh, on the result and see perfectly fine. And uh, because you know now R is just the integer and um, this will indeed type check. Let's take a look at what um, this will tell me. So the result looks good because one plus two plus three is six, but the log message is a little lacking. It's telling us that three plus three equals six, but we did a, another uh, a plus before that, right? We added one and two to get the three in the first place. And we've somehow lost that. And when we look at the code here, we can see why we lost it. It's because, well, we you know got out the logs from calc plus and then we didn't do anything with them, right? We just threw them out. So that's a that's a that's a problem. So let's um, let's fix that. So instead of directly returning the result of calc plus r and, r and um, c, let's give another result, right? So we have r two and logs two. So these are the logs from the first plus, and these are the logs from the second plus. And so um, let's go ahead and think what we want the result to be. So we don't want to return r. Because we did use R, we used R by feeding it into calc plus. And so we're gonna go ahead and return R2. But now we have logs for each intermediate calculation. And so we just wanna paste them together. Now, when I run this, I indeed get, hey, first I ran one plus two getting three, and then I ran three plus three getting six. And now we've got our code. And so this, right, so what's going on here, right? I'm looking very carefully at all of the um, all of the results that I'm getting, I'm making sure I'm using all of them, right? Before we could have figured out that there was a problem because logs was not used at all. And um, I thought about what I wanted my code to do, which was to say, return the result of having done all the calculations and return the logs of doing both um, this and this. And if this looks way uglier than the composition operator I showed you earlier, you would be right. It is way uglier. And you'd be also wondering maybe, can we make it cleaner? Can we write a higher order function that abstracts this away? And the answer is also yes. And we will talk about that when we talk about monads. Okay, I have six minutes left. Um, I, let me check if I covered all the things people asked me. Um, okay, I didn't do shrinking and calculator, um, but I'm gonna skip that because I don't have enough time. Uh, and um, let me just answer some quick questions. So we'll, we'll, we'll do these three and then wrap it up. Okay, so question, um, is there a main function in Haskell? The answer is yes. So um, let's say that I wanted to, uh, let's do a new program. So let's say I wanted to write a little, um, little um, you know, script in Haskell. 
So I've named it blah. Um, so is there a main function? Yes, it's just called main. And um, if you have looked at some Haskell tutorials, um, they'll be like, hey, then there's this do thing. And then you can like print hello world. And you know, this is your program. And um, we're not uh, we're not going to run this one in GHCI, and so we're just going to uh, uh, use another command called run GHC, which lets me run Haskell scripts. And um, you know what it indeed does is it runs the main function and gives me hello world. Now, why is there this do thing? What's the type signature print? Like, how do I do a more complicated uh, function this way? Those are all topics for when we talk about monads. But um, the short answer is yes. To define a main function, you just write a function called main and you put something in it. Um, very simple thing you can do is print and then whatever thing you want to do. Um, there's a question which is about the previous uh, code I wrote, which is um, would, uh, yes, uh, would the um, concatenating things together uh, uh, be inefficient because of laziness? Uh, and Oh, what is the answer to this question? Mm. It's going to be okay, but it's only because of laziness. Um, but it's kind of hard for me to explain why. Um, there's certainly more efficient ways to do this, which are obviously okay. But I think I think this will be okay as well. Will it be okay? There's going to be a bunch of extra work you're going to do. I'm not sure. I actually don't know the answer to this question. That's a great question. And um, yeah, I don't know the answer to it off the top of my head. Uh, what is GAC good or not good at optimizing? Um, and how does it reduce the overhead associated with recursion? Um, so this one is simple enough to answer. So when I write a recursive function, like um, uh, for example, here's a version of sum which uses an accumulator. So I got my list and I got my accumulator. And you know, how do I do this? I just say sum x is accumulator plus x. Actually, it's a little trickier than that. I have to um, uh, this is not this is not quite efficient, but uh, I need to explain laziness to say why this is inefficient. And so the question is like, isn't this really slow, right? And indeed, if you wrote something like this in Python, people would give you a side eye because um, this is a recursive call, right? And in Python, you've got a stack, and you'd keep um, you know uh, doing more things on the stack, and then eventually you'd stack overflow if your list was too long. In Haskell, this isn't a problem, and it's because of a thing called tail call optimization. Because this call to sum is sort of the, uh, there's nothing else to do after we're done executing it. Haskell will actually compile this code into a tight loop. Um, there will not be any recursion involved. It'll actually do a loop in question. Now, how do you know, uh, that, that's, a, that's a lie by the way. I have to, I have to add, um, let me just do it right. I have to do it like this to actually get that. Uh, yeah, don't ask me, don't ask me what all this stuff is. But how do I know this was actually good? And the answer is you kind of don't. You're kind of trusting GHC to like do the right thing in this situation. But um, you don't have to take GHC blindly on trust. Um, you can actually ask GHC to tell you what the result of the function is after optimizing it. Um, and uh, there's some command line flags, which I'm not going to tell you because it's not relevant to this class, but you can look it up in the manual if you're interested. Um, GHC, as I said, um, will take your program and translate it into this uh, intermediate representation called core and then do a bunch of optimizations on it. So if you're not sure whether or not some code is getting optimized or not, you can run GHC with a flag that says basically, hey, tell me what the core you're producing in this situation is. Or if you know you're wondering about tail recursion, you can ask it to give you the actual assembly associated with the function in question. And that you know, will tell you whether or not an optimization is happening or, not, happening or not. So you can assume that tail call optimization is gonna happen in Haskell. And you can also assume that Haskell is going to do a lot of inlining. And we talked about inlining in the Lambda Calculus and it's no 
uh, no, um, no mystery that um, Haskell is all about inlining. And um, the reason for that, right, is that we do a lot of code that you know has these like small piecewise things, right? We were just talking about like map and filter, and we were saying, hey, you know, um, you can just take write lots of itty bitty functions and then paste them together. Is that inefficient? Well, not necessarily, because Haskell is going to try to inline them and try to you know do things to um, put them together. In fact, there's something very interesting with lists called uh, stream fusion, where um, Haskell can actually get rid of the intermediate um, data structures that normally would have been allocated if you're like you know doing a bunch of maps and then filters and stuff like that. Um, there's a question which is, is Haskell stackless? The answer is no. So if there's still stuff you need to do, there's still a stack and you can stack overflow it. Um, in fact, uh, if I do something silly like uh, you know try to fold L um, a very large list, What the type of this is? Okay, it's the other way. Oh well, it didn't stack overflow, but there, there, there's like a way to make it stack overflow, in this case. Okay, last question: How do I structure my Haskell project? Um, so the keywords you need to know here are Cabal, and um, if you like, uh, also a uh, stack. So uh, basically, um, everything I've shown you here is working directly with the compiler. But if you're like doing a big and fancy Haskell project, which by the way, none of the homeworks are doing, um, they're all single files, um, you'll want to actually create what's called a Cabal package. And then you can just think of that like as a Python package or a Rust crate or something like that. And um, uh, you can call Cabal init, and that'll give you a little wizard for creating a project from scratch. Um, stack is another option you can use. Stack is nice because um, it is basically the equivalent of an operating system distro, but only for Haskell packages. So it says, hey, here are a bunch of packages which are known to play well together, and you don't have to worry about like you know dependency solving or stuff like that. Okay, I'm two minutes over. Uh, I'm going to let everyone go. Thanks very much. And uh, if there are any last questions um, before we hop, uh, let me know. Cheers.